Well, for the last time this year, we're joined by uh, Justin Marshall, who I think is uh, back into the wide open spaces and the fresh air and the clean air of Queenstown after being away with the All Black Tour. Justin, nice to be home, I imagine, and hitting a few golf balls as well, I suppose, since you touched down. Yeah, hi, Telf, and um, good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's great to always get home to New Zealand, um, but equally, it was brilliant uh, to be back in the UK and Europe for the first time um, for me since 2018, and really for the All Blacks, to be fair. Yes, they went there uh, the year before, but that was still under quite a few restrictions. Uh, so to have freedom back and, and be back in that part of the world and experience rugby like it should be, like we know it, um, has been in the past. Uh, full stadiums, you know, you the likes of Twickenham, Millennium Stadium, uh, Murrayfield, uh, was absolutely amazing. So I really enjoyed being away. It's always nice to come home. Um, and you're right about the golf. Yes, I've been frustrating myself on the golf course and getting back. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was reviewing the rugby year with y- your good mate Grant Nisbet. And I said to Nisbo at the end, I said, OK, have a look at this All Black performance overall in 2022. And I think we agreed that they'd played 13 test matches, won eight, lost four, and drew one. An 8 4 1 record for an All Black team is not great. It's not absolutely the pits. So I said to him, give them a mark. Give this All Black squad or this All Black team a mark out of 10. So I'll put the same question to you and I'll tell you what Nisbo's score was uh-huh. after you tell me what your score is. Yeah, OK. Well, look, I, I certainly feel that that, uh, that that record this year is not adequate. It's not up to uh, All Black standard. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, recreating history in a, in a negative aspect um, never sits comfortably. You know, losing to Ireland for the first time on our own shores um, in a test series and in a test match. Losing to Argentina for the first time on our own shores um, has damaged the jersey. And, and if anybody wants to sit down and argue with me about that, then good luck to them, because uh, I know what it's like to carry the legacy uh, of All Blacks gone in the past, and these guys have let the jersey down because they've recreated history uh, in, a, in the wrong way. So you've got to take those two things into the season um, very much so. Obviously, the disappointment with the draw against England, uh, dropping a test match quite comfortably to South Africa uh, in South Africa, uh, yeah, look, um, one of the one of the the worst years I've had in the last decade, if you ask me, and a lot of inconsistency in there as well. Um, you know, they struggled against Japan, they struggled against Scotland for long long periods. Yes, they got the wins, but if you look at the micro elements of it, it wasn't a cakewalk by any by any means. So, look, at, at most, I'm going to give them a six. They had some success. They do, still did find a way to win some of those test matches, but uh, it didn't fill me with. Um, great enthusiasm and um, massive confidence that we are going to be going to the Rugby uh, World Cup clearly in great form um, and a real threat to those teams that are, are, are at the top of the, the pedestal in World Rugby at the moment. Well, you'll be pleased to know that Nisbo's score or Nisbo's mark for the All Blacks in 2022 was 6.5. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, you probably were watching the same games for most of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we probably were, um, but now, if you if you think about it, and, and the listeners out there, you think about what I've just said. You know, a lot a lot of those uh, things that I've mentioned um, that the All Blacks haven't been um, at their best. That uh, you, you can't clearly say that they've had a great season. And, no, um, no. Mind and, you, and and, and, and but, but anybody feel super confident about the side going into next year, saying, "Hey, we are finally." through that little lull. Um, we're actually firing on all cylinders now. We're assured of our starting 15, are we? I don't think so. Uh, so, yeah, that's the reason. And and that's a, and, and that's a generous six. I'm, I'm just saying that because mm. I don't want to be too negative. Mm. So that, I guess, leads on to the question about the um, viability and the decision to stay with uh, Ian Foster. Um, I suppose Foster's very pleased that the New Zealand Rugby Union haven't taken the leaf out of the Morocco uh, Football Federation who fired their <laughs> c- uh, coach about two months before the World Cup and it was a very, mm-hmm. insp- was a very inspired choice uh, as, as uh, results have shown. Uh, did the Rugby Union do the right thing, do you think, in sticking with the status quo? OK, they made some personnel adjustments under Foster, but staying with Foster? Well, if they had... Obviously, a very difficult decision to make, didn't they? they? They believed that the status quo was going to work for them. And when I mean status quo, that was 
the end of the Steve Hansen era, they still felt that the, the achievements, the, the significant World Cup wins, uh, the success that they had under Steve Hansen would just filter through to that core group of uh, coaches and administ- administrators, support staff, uh, and that things would carry on their merry way. But, you know, I, look, I don't know about you, Tal, but I certainly saw the writing on the wall at that, that, that 2019 Rugby World Cup where things were starting to wobble a little bit uh, and maybe then it was time for a fresh change. They opted out of that. Uh, and then obviously in Foster took over uh, and then there was more problems. Uh, the success rate dropped and um, lots of issues within the camp allegedly. So they then come to that ultimate uh, ultimatum of after the Springbok test of, of changing coach and, and they had the opportunity to do that and they still feel somewhere the New Zealand Rugby Union and with the players, and let's not forget the players, there, there, there was a massive amount of support after that South African test at Alice Park coming out of senior players and players within the Crusaders camp for Ian Foster. So mm. somewhere in there, amongst all of that, they still believe that the right man is at the helm and that they can go to the World Cup and get the job done. The problem I have that with that, South, and people will know this, I've been the scrum all year, is for me, it's not just about rugby World Cups. And I've mentioned, I feel, the damage that has already been done to the legacy of the All Black jersey under this watch in the last couple of years uh, and how history is being hit. Uh, and I, I look more into it than that. And, and you know, that, that, that's the problem that I have, that they haven't recognised that it's not just about winning a Rugby World Cup, it's about not losing to Argentina, it's about not losing a Test Series to Ireland. Um, you know, all of those sort of factors come into the All Black jersey. And at the moment... It's been uh, bleeding too much. Mm. But uh, we are where we are because they made the decision to, to keep with the status quo through to the end of the Rugby World Cup. Uh, and, and that's what we've got to live with. So I hope that they can find that mojo that everybody feels the All Blacks have. And, and I really, really do, as a former All Black, wish the All Blacks all the, all the most success for, for 2023 because we really need it. The other thing that I, I sense is at work here is this historical precedence of the New Zealand Rugby Union as a very conservative body. You can go right back through the history. You can take some obvious examples like the Springbok Tour in 1981 and all sorts of things, but they tend to err, if that's the right word, on the side of a conservative kind of decision. And I think um, this is partly worked in Foster's favour, that uh, they're, not, they're not up for making radical changes, particularly relatively close to a Rugby World Cup, and um, they'll sink or swim by that decision, I suppose, uh, in 12 months' time. Who knows what we'll be discussing if we're talking about the all-black coaching position in 12 months from now. But anyway, a couple of things. I suppose they certainly had a far better record. I was talking to an Aussie rugby uh, writer the other day, and uh, mm. the Aussies' record this year was five wins out of 14. So uh, Dave Rennie might have a bit of a nervous Christmas, um, particularly after this news. I'm sure you've probably picked up on it, that Eddie, da- uh, Eddie Jones had an hour the unemployed coach from England uh, had a conversation with uh, Hamish McLennan, the boss of Australian rugby, and we've spoken to a couple of people inside the Australian rugby circle this week, and the feeling seems to be that it was an informal chat. No offers were made other than the fact that McLennan sounded out Jones about the possibility of coming back and working for Australian rugby, and that can cover a multitude of sins and jobs. What do you make of all of this? Uh, I'm not surprised. Um, I was I was really surprised uh, to see uh, the, the, the rumours around him being involved with Cust, uh, simply because in France, because when I was in South Africa in the middle of the year, um, I met up with a couple of key people uh, that know Eddie really well um, and look after him, and the, the sort of murmurs that they were given to me at that point was that post-Rugby uh, World Cup that Eddie Jones would be looking to go back to probably looking to go back to Australia under a director of rugby mm, role. Mm. So that's what I was expecting. Obviously, um, you know, he's been let go from his position in England sooner than that. Um, but it, it comes as no surprise to me that those rumours and murmurs are out there about him having conversations with Australian rugby because I believe that those conversations had already been had. So it, it, was, it was under that role, you know, and, and that, that's a very much a, a UK... Um, English sort of type thing where yeah. there's a, a, a director of rugby that's mm. above the head coach 
but has input. Um, so it would probably be quite a good role for him. Um, but I yes, I would guess it makes Dave Rennie a bit nervous. But yes, I, I am not surprised to hear that. I yes, I mean, it seems just uh, sort of um, incomprehensible that the Australian Rugby Union, OK, a change of personnel for sure, but they fired this guy in 2005. They terminated his contract in 2005, Eddie mm. Jones. And 17 years later, you go back into the fut- back into the past to hire him again as coach. But as you say, a different role. Uh, the game is a lot more yep. sophisticated, more scientific, I suppose, in many ways now. So you do see these people pop up in these positions, director of rugby and you know, head of development and uh, recruitment and so forth, positions that never existed in the past. But um, anyway, we'll see what happens. So where do England go, do you think? I mean, is, do you think, what's your grapevine telling you? Is Razor Robertson uh, interested in this job? Yeah, look, I think it makes uh, more sense for him. Um, you know, he's still got a reasonably young family, um, albeit they are growing up. Um, but, you know, that's never easy to completely change your lifestyle and, and, and go to the, the Northern Hemisphere um, because, of, because of those this, that disconnect with family. Um, so, you know, Australia is, is literally just a couple of hours away. So, uh, look, I haven't heard any, anything um, more than what anyone else would towards uh, Razor looking uh, towards Australia. Uh, so, uh, look, I, I certainly know one thing. He's a very good man of mine, um, and, and I don't often put myself out um, on a ledge because I know that, you know, he wants to make sure that uh, his confidence is, is trusted confidence. But, when he talks to people, but the one thing that he has told me um, uh, unequivocally is the fact that he wants to coach international rugby and he wants to do it sooner rather than later. And, and if that's not going to be for the All Blacks, then it's going to be for a side that he wants, mm. that, that he mm. believes. Yeah. That's right, he, he said, he has, he has said that publicly. Pub- he yeah. told me that over a beer, I just spat my beer out. <laughs> like, well, he has said that publicly yeah, so, as well, hasn't he? Oh, uh, yeah, has he? Okay, yeah. I wasn't mm. aware of that, but yeah. I was like... Did you just say a team that could beat the All Blacks? He's like, yeah, mate. Oh, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the ultimate for me is to coach the best team or teams in the world. And I've got to be capable, if it's not the All Blacks, of beating the All Blacks because mm. that's what gets me out of bed as a coach, you know, to go out there, test myself against the best and beat them. So, yeah, you know, that, that's his mindset. But, no, I haven't heard anything about Australia or anything more about um, anything else. But, uh, you know, obviously... Uh, there's the New Zealand um, rugby union that are, are not have not been as transparent as they should have been with him. Um, that will probably make it be make him a bit anxious about whether or not mm. Um, mm. you know that job is ever offered to him. Mm. <laughs> oh, these are interesting times indeed. Well, the New Zealand rugby union, I guess, yeah. finally we've got more on their plate than uh, Orazer Robertson, I suppose, at the moment. Uh, even though I mentioned <laughs> looking after him and trying to keep him as a priority. Uh, but this uh, news that is broken around this com- French company, which is a major sponsor of the New Zealand Rugby Football Union, Eltrad, apparently it's a multi-million dollar contract, signed last year for six years, and now the head of this company, um, Mohed Eltrad, uh, has been uh, found guilty of um, some very serious charges, corruption, peddling, uh, fined, uh, best part of 100000 New Zealand dollars, and uh, given a suspended jail sentence for 18 months, and uh, Bernard Laporte, uh, former uh, French player and coach and now vice chairman uh, of the International World Rugby Board uh, is also uh, up before the courts and has been uh, found guilty of some of these charges as well. This is a terrible look, uh, Justin, isn't it? I mean, I know you've just got back and you haven't uh, had an opportunity to absorb all of this, but I just hope, I just hope rugby um, doesn't go down the road of the scandals that have... Um, uh, got in the way of people like the IOC and FIFA, who's had a fair share of scandals of recent times. Uh, rugby's always prided itself, hasn't it, been free of corruption and free of that sort of stuff. But uh, who knows where we're going now with rugby? Yeah, you're absolutely right, and and that is shocking news. Um, you know, you never want uh, one of your major uh, sponsors, supporters, finances uh, to be. In, in the headlines for, for reasons that are looking incredibly dodgy uh, and, and you know, certainly isn't great for the image um, of the New Zealand Rugby Union, let alone, let alone the company involved. Um, and, and really, you know, when you think about um, trying to sustain a future and to get good financial banking, uh, backing, I should say, and confidence 
for that future. Um, you know, you need, you're only doing it because you need it. Uh, and so this is a headache big time that the New Zealand Rugby Union do not need. Um, obviously, they'll be now under the pump to, to make a, an informed decision about how they proceed, you know, because, uh, again, it's, it's very, very untidy press. Um, but equally, you know, they've, they've obviously got an outlay of revenue that they need and, uh, from that support. Um, and it's about uh, trying to sort of macro manage, manage it um, initially and then trying to find a pathway forward of how to either A, stick and believe that it's uh, one person that's corrupt and, and, the, and the rest of it is OK, um, or saying there could be bigger problems and, and do we get out while we can? Yeah, can exactly. We get out? Yeah. Know, it's a horrible, horrible. Yeah, it's thing, exactly. You, 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 New Zealand rugby, we should point out here, New Zealand rugby don't appear to have done anything wrong, anything illegal, anything immoral, no, anything under, no. t- under the table, uh, and are caught up in this b- business uh, kind of, you know, you know, like they're being dragged into it against their will, and mm-hmm. uh, you sympathise with them having to make this decision um, because it's a very difficult one to make. Anyway, Justin, I'm sure you want to get onto the golf course next door to where you live, so uh, I'll wish you all the best and have a very happy Christmas and uh, look forward to hearing you on the air again uh, with all these big matches next year. Yeah, I will. Thanks very much, Talf, and I uh, wish everybody out there a very happy Christmas and New Year, and uh, we'll see you in uh, 23 for a bumper, bumper year of rugby in particular. Cheers, mate.